Hello and welcome to The Arise Interview, 60 glorious minutes of multifaceted discussion where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things and we feature the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anyagogo coming up in the next hour as journalists continue to operate under what some say are increasingly difficult circumstances in Nigeria. Amnesty International releases a new report accusing President Buhari's government of launching a deliberate assault on members of the media, subjecting them to harassment, intimidation, arbitrary arrests, attacks and detentions, all in an attempt to silence what the human rights group says are dissenting voices. As Amnesty's briefing sparks fresh international concern about f press freedom in Nigeria, we speak to the director of Amnesty International Nigeria, who is one of the authors of that scathing report. And we'll hear from one journalist who's been arrested by the Nigerian police in the course of his work. And later, we'll have reaction from one of President Buhari's top supporters in a moment. Now, press freedom is under severe threat in Nigeria. And increasingly, there is a dangerous human rights cost that comes with journalists, bloggers and activists doing their jobs or expressing dissenting opinions. That's according to the human rights organization Amnesty International. Amnesty has been examining the cases of journalists who've been detained, attacked, threatened or intimidated over the past five years in Nigeria. The organization's published a report which casts an ominous cloud over free expression and media freedom in the country, revealing what it says is a disturbing escalation in threats and attacks by the authorities against Nigerian journalists who've criticized the government on both traditional and social media. It says that media practitioners are now forced to operate under a thickening climate of fear, citing numerous incidents which it says underscore the deepening shadows being cast over the media landscape in Nigeria, from violent attacks and arrests to detentions and intimidation by government agents, incidents that are systematically chipping away at the pillars of this country's democracy. Well, in a moment, we'll speak with the director of Amnesty International Nigeria, Osai Ojigo. But first, here's a snippet from Amnesty's briefing on the current state of free expression and media freedom in Nigeria. The testimonies and evidence Amnesty International has documented and which will be presented to you today show that the balance required by states to ensure that the freedom of expression is respected in the context of its laws is tilting dangerously away from the very essence and character of the rights itself. Laws such as the Terrorism Prevention Act, as amended, and the Cyber Crime Act Prohibition Pre Prevention Act are being applied by Nigerian authorities and their agents in a manner that clamps down on the press and restricts freedom of expression. Individual journalists, media activists, and bloggers have become a target of laws meant to protect our collective safety and security. In 2019 alone, at least 19 journalists and bloggers have been detained for sharing information or for merely just doing their job. Media houses are also targeted, and some have been raided in our report, we highlight two radio stations, Breeze 99.9 FM, Nasarawa State, and Fresh 105.9 FM in Oyo State, which were demolished under alleged breaches of environmental or land laws with little or no time to respond to the um, evictions and the demolition notice that were served on them. And that's a snippet from Amnesty International's briefing. Well, for more on the current state of press freedom in Nigeria and the issue of freedom of expression in this country, I'm joined now in the studio by the director of Amnesty International Nigeria, Osai Ojiga. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for and, having uh, me. We obviously saw a, a clip there of you speaking at that uh, briefing uh, earlier. Just summarize for us the main standout points in that report of on sort of freedom of expression that you've just published? 
Thank you, Charles. So our report covers a number of areas, uh, predominantly arrests, detention, criminalization of journalists, stigmatization for covering sensitive issues, particularly those that harbor around oil wealth and um, the Boko Haram insurgency in the Northeast. We also have media houses, um, their proprietors being targeted, invited, um, demolished um, radio houses, raided um, newsrooms, and interestingly, bloggers and even ordinary people who are not citizen journalists or professional journalists who were questioned regarding posts on social media. So it covers a whole array of people who are trying to disseminate information either online through media outlets or through hosting on-air programs. Um, one fascinating story was about a journalist that actually left the country because he felt his life was so threatened there was no way he could do a job that he loves based on an analysis he was doing on, his, on a TV show. So it's, what was fascinating for us was that a pattern is emerging and that is when certain people don't like what you say or what has been put out, they abuse the apparatus of power of their office in order to push their displeasure. And what was even more shocking is the kinds of um, allegations that these people are then, they then have to face. So you have someone like um, Abiri Jones, who three years ago, we were all looking for him. He resurfaced after a lot of publicity and pressure was released, got judgment against the DSS for 10.5 million era last year, only for him to be rearrested this year, and then he's being charged on terrorism charges. So it's just fascinating the way the cycle of um, abuse is turning out to be. And it's when you investigate the issues, you ask yourself, couldn't they have had a conversation? Couldn't there have been a discussion or couldn't they have provided alternative information to say these facts that you put out here are wrong or we are walking into or looking into these issues? Making journalism a dangerous job to have is now becoming more apparent mm. because we are seeing cases which we did not report in the briefing of people who choose to avoid certain stories because they don't want to be in the of eye. Self-censorship, self exactly, basically. In the yes. eye of the powers that mm. be. And in, in this extensive um, research and investigation that you've done, are there examples of what the journalists actually reported that incurred the wrath of the government? Yes. In the cases that we highlighted in our report, we asked for samples of the offending piece um, of the reports or the situation that occurred, and then how did they go about it? In some cases, what was baffling, like in the case of the guy who was accused of posting uh, a photo of um, a governor, um, he didn't initiate the photo, he shared it. Um, and so the question was, how do you go about investigating these issues? What are the steps you need to take mm. within the criminal justice system? Then in some others, there were stories that they said they did, which they later on turned out was not true. And then there were cases of story which were considered sensitive. And so the issue was trying to find the journalistic source. And we all know a journalist is only as good as a source. Absolutely. So you can't ask a journalist to disclose a source. Mm. Then there's no way he or she is going to work anymore. So these were um, issues which are ordinary within the course of journalism mm. and in reporting and disseminating information that shouldn't really be scaring um, someone in a position of power, but rather should encourage them to investigate and to actually get to the root of the problem. It seems more like intimidation mm. um, in order to look good in the, in the media, in the public's eye. And what, is, uh, what did your investigation find are the main ways that the Nigerian government or Nigerian authorities go about intimidating journalists in this country? So you find that people are invited at short notice to police stations. Uh, people are abducted in their homes because people come in, uh, sometimes they do not identify themselves as security agents and they are taken away. So people are fearful, they mm. think they are kidnappers only to discover that they are actually police or the secret service. Then you also find where um, people are surveilled 
and then when they are found they are asked to re release their private phones their laptops so that they can check information on it then physical assault so like in the case of mary Carey, she was taking uh, a photo of what was happening in front of her how the the um, authorities were actually manhandling people in the process of carrying out their statutory duties. And she was rough handled and thrown into a vehicle for attempting to do so mm. and detained for several days. So you see physical, some verbal threats, intimidation in terms of the way and manner. Mm. You know, there's a way you can approach someone and say, oh, we'd want to talk to you about something. And then you come and grab someone roughly. Already the person knows, oh, I'm in deep trouble. For, the, um, for this person to come with such violence and with so many men. Like in the case of the Lumba brothers, it was amazing. They were at home enjoying the Christmas New Year holidays. And then you have a whole group of armed men come into their compound, ransack everyone looking for um, one of the brothers, raided everyone. Then when they found the two they were looking for left, you know, it was so mm. dramatic. And you, the only thing you can imagine is that the purpose was to send a strong message. Hmm. We are bigger, we are stronger than you. Don't mess with us. Right. And, and is it your assessment, obviously you've done a comprehensive investigation, um, is it your assessment that journalists in Nigeria have historically been better treated or worse in the past than they are today under President Buhari? I think there are fluctuations. If you, you would even see that in our research. Right. Over time, Nigeria is one of the countries that we are considered on the rankings to fairly be free. And considering we are one of those that had one of the strongest press under mm. military rule, um, it saddens us to see the kind of challenges journalists now have to experience now. And in our research, you see it fluctuates. So like 2019, we've not gotten to the end of the year already. We have recorded, and this is just the minimum based on the ones that have come to our notice, 19 cases. Last year, it was probably about four. Mm. 2016 was also a year that was quite high. So you ask yourself, what are the things triggering and causing this fluctuation in terms of interest of um, actors? And one thing that comes to our mind is people increasingly begin to use the law for their personal benefit right. when there are no consequences. And we are seeing that there's more incidents at state level rather than at the national mm. so there might even be a lot more that we're not aware of because oftentimes if you're a local news reporter and that is what we've tried to do with this research most of the cases people will find interestingly involved areas that people don't even know the name of the paper or the name of the on-air personality and they're like oh is this happening in Nigeria. Yeah, but I suppose the key question, and I'm sorry to interrupt you there, we've got to take a break in a moment, is that does this suggest, because your, your press briefing and your press release almost suggests that incontrovertibly the Buhari administration is seeking to further restrict press freedom in the country. Is that a fact based on your investigation? Our investigation shows that the government at state level and federal level through their agents are increasingly using laws to repress journalistic freedom okay, in please, Nigeria. Please hold that thought. We'll come back in a moment. You're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our discussion about the apparent squeeze on the freedom of expression in Nigeria. We'll speak with one journalist who's had a run in with the Nigerian government. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anya Gordon. Now concern is growing in Nigeria and beyond that the Buhari government is by its alleged hostile actions against the media challenging what has long been regarded globally as the orthodoxy of liberal democracy. A challenge that according to Amnesty International has little time or tolerance for anybody that questions or fails to conform to the government's concept of what binds this country together. In its latest briefing, Amnesty says that journalists, bloggers and activists are facing increased risks simply for publishing critical articles demanding accountability from the authorities and are being demonized as people who are against Nigeria. 
The group says that as a consequence, such hostility towards human rights has rolled back democracy in this country. But the government has dismissed allegations that it is undermining democracy or attacking the free press as unfounded. Well, we'll speak some more with the director of Amnesty International Nigeria, Osai Ojigo, and we'll be joined in a moment by one journalist who's run up against the Nigerian government. And later, we'll hear a robust defense from the Buhari Media Organization, a group that supports President Buhari. But first, here's another snippet from that Amnesty International briefing criticizing the state of freedom of expression in Nigeria. It's so I took pictures of their activities, and over 15 of them climbed down on me, seized my phone from me, and then I was taken to court where we met the absence of the magistrates, and from there I was taken to prison where I was detained for three days before my union got away that I'm in prison. Because at the first day when I was uh, arrested, I, I wasn't given a right, I was barred from making phone calls, not until some other person who was arrested alongside myself lent me his phone, which I used to get to my family. And that's when they started running around and letting every other person to know that I was being arrested. So that was what I faced. And luckily for me, so many people uh, stood up to speak on my behalf. And I'm very grateful to Amnesty International. Let us not just stop this campaign at freedom of expression for, Nigeria, for journalists. Other Nigerians, too, need your help. So for those inmates, I, I believe if we can take a step now to maybe review their cases. And not because I met a mother that said she, she left her children from the first day she was arrested, she has not been able to communicate with anybody. So nobody knows, and she has children of about two, four, six ages. So who is taking care of them? Nobody knows of our whereabouts. And that's another clip from that Amnesty International briefing. Well, for more on Amnesty International's allegation that the government is whittling down the freedom of the press in Nigeria, the director of Amnesty in Nigeria, Osai Ojigo, is still with me in the studio. And I'm delighted to say that we're joined also by Chida Onuma, who is a Nigerian journalist, activist and author, arrested last month by Nigeria's secret police for allegedly attempting to undermine public order and national security. Security. Uh, thank you, Osai, for staying with us, and thank you, Mr. Anuma, for coming in. And I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, tell us briefly what happened to you, why you ran up against the government. Well, thanks for having me, Charles. It's a pleasure to be here. I think uh, that was on September 29. It was a Sunday. So that was just last month? Yeah, basically. last month, right. about two weeks ago. I just arrived in the country at about 4.15 on uh, a Lufthansa Airways flight. I had been attending a conference in Gothenburg, Sweden, and uh, I'd called up a friend earlier when I was at the airport in uh, Frankfurt that the flight would arrive at about 4.15 and that he should be at the airport to pick me. So we arrived. I, I went to the baggage section to pick up my pass through immigration, picked up my bag, and just as I was about to exit, somebody stopped me and said, uh, I'm from, he flashed his ID card and said, I'm from the Department of State Security. Could you follow me to my office? And I didn't say anything. And because somehow I've, uh, I know the drill, I've had encounters both as a student and as a right. journalist. So I knew not to uh, create a scene. Not to, I didn't even ask him why he stopped me. So I followed him. They took me to their office at the airport, moved my bags into the room, took my phone, took my passport. And I sat down, pulled out a book, and started reading. Nobody said anything. Every once in a while, somebody would walk up to me and say, oh, uh, sir, don't worry. It's, it would just take about 5, 10, 15 minutes. I, I believed them initially uh, that because I didn't imagine mm. I hadn't written anything re you know, prior to my uh, traveling out of the country three weeks earlier. So about 30 minutes into uh, uh, my detention, one of the men in the room just turned to me and said, you are a Biafran. How come you have a Nigerian passport? I said, I beg your pardon. I'm a Nigerian. That's why I have a Nigerian passport. Uh, there is no country like Biafra, and I can possibly have a Biafran passport. And he said, uh, that, but that's not what's written on your shirt. 
So I looked at my shirt again to be sure it was what I had, which is where all Biafra and the inscription on, mm. uh, on my shirt, which is the title of a book I published uh, in tw first in May 2016. Right. So, so really, you're wearing the T-shirt yes. was an advertisement for your book, book rather yes. than an attempt to subvert the sort of public uh, order. Yeah, it wasn't. Like I mean, and not that I'm aware of. The word Biafra wasn't a banned word. If uh, so there wasn't any basis right. to say uh, you're wearing a T-shirt that says we are all beautiful. Uh, so uh, they kept me there for about two hours, then took me to their headquarters in downtown. I was there for another four hours or so. But I think two hours into my stay at the headquarters, somebody came and started talking and said, so that was when the discussion began about uh, you know, why mm. they... Uh, stopped me and arrested me and the guy said... So basically there was no ulterior motive. You, you, in other words, they, they stopped you because they saw the t-shirt you were wearing. Well, it's not because you'd written some article or something out of the book that you had written. Had, no, right. not that I'm aware of. They didn't right. say anything. It was much later, as I said, when I got to the headquarters two hours into my stay there that uh, somebody walked up and said, uh, uh, well, we received report from people on the flight who said you were coming into the country to join uh, some people who were planning to right. cause some insurrection in the country. And I said, well, I live here, even though I do travel a lot, but I couldn't have been coming inside the country and I don't belong to any fringe group or any group mm. that has anything to do with uh, terrorism or plots to cause this affection. So we talked about that then. He now said, uh, the we also have this report that uh, if you wear this T-shirt to town, it could cause disaffection and cause, you know, there'll be trouble and all of that. I said, well, I've been wearing this T-shirt for three and a half years. I first wore it publicly at Yaradua Center when this book was first launched. A lot of the people who were around also wore the T-shirt, and it's my signature T-shirt most Fridays when I go to the right. office. Just out of curiosity, wear. what yeah. is your book about? Well, it's about... it's about the politics of Nigeria, right. the crisis of nationhood, basically. That's the bottom line. Uh, the book calls for uh, a restructuring of the Nigerian nation, the need to review our federalism and so on as the basis for the current crisis. Right. So, so the reason you chose that title is simply to say that nothing's changed, really. That yeah, well, the the I mean, demands I of the Biafrans is similar to it, the it, agitations it, of people in Nigeria. Yeah, something close to that. I think the title of the book came out of a conversation, a public conversation that took place about four years ago, indeed at the height of the Namdi Kanu mm. issue when he was arrested and detained. There was this debate uh, among public intellectuals in Nigeria, Chidi Odinkalu, Jubril Ibrahim, and all of that. I think it started when Professor Jubril Ibrahim of CDD wrote an article, how do we deal with the Igbo question? Mm. Some public intellectuals from the southeastern parts of the country responded that there is no Igbo question, there is a Nigerian question. Right. So, I so on the strength of that, yeah, so on the, right. on the strength of that, I made my own intervention and saying that whether we're looking at the problem, the crisis in Southwest many years ago, the June 12 crisis or the Boko Haram crisis or the Niger Delta militancy and all, there is agitation in every part of the country. Right. It's not just the Biafra thing. So to that extent, we are all Biafra. Right, okay, I understand that. Let me just bring Osaya Jigo, Director of Amnesty International Nigeria, in. This is obviously slightly different from, I mean, because you were, he's not being sort of penalized because he's a journalist. I mean, he, he, he's being sort of, they, they picked him up because he was wearing a T-shirt that given the, the, the sort of the circumstances in Nigeria with agitations for Biafra and all that sort of thing that they felt might, you know, get people, rub people up the wrong way. Yeah. Um, but just beyond that particular incident, um, President Buhari, of course, has travels abroad, I mean, I, I see him sort of all over the world, um, claiming that the rule of law um, is, is subject, well, not even, not even abroad, even in Nigeria, that the rule of law is, is, is sort of vaguely um, defined um, by national security issues. Um, 
Uh, and I'm just wondering how much that causes concern as part of what you, you've been investigating, because it, it has in fact been used to justify the arbitrary detention of some journalists who the police claim are a threat to national security. And in a sort of perverse way, I mean, it's the same sort of thing where he's been said, you're wearing a T-shirt and potentially that's a threat to national security. Yeah. And that's the worrying trend because even within the framework of rights mm. and freedom of expression is one of those rights that y it's applied within the law and it's not an absolute right. But the standards say it has to be a law that is reasonable within a democratic society. It has to be, there has to be a balance mm. in terms of how that law is applied in such a way that it, you don't lose the essence of the right itself. And so that balancing act is what the government needs to do. And they cannot tilt it. It must always be at a balance. And even if you put a temporary imposition to say, okay, we're not going to allow this for a set like a, there's a curfew. Mm. It cannot be an indefinite curfew. There must be a beginning and there must be an end. And you must constantly assess at what point in time has this threat been alleviated. But there are also other ways through which you can deal with terrorism and security issues. And I feel that in some of the cases that came up to us, it was more brute force. It was not about intellectually dissecting the issues. It was not about independently investigating mm. without bias. You might not like the person, but go and examine what exactly was said. How was it shared? Right. What purpose did it seek? Then there must also be an intent. And then that would give you, point you in the right direction. Right. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you to just stay with us. And I want to thank you, Mr. Anuma, for coming in to join us. You're watching The Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat about allegations that the Nigerian government is clamping down hard on members of the press. We'll have reaction from one of President Buhari's top supporters, Barrister Ali Abdullahi from the Buhari Media Organization. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anyegolu. Now you may know that in the latest World Press Index for 2019, Nigeria has been ranked in the 120th position, dropping down one step from the position it held in 2018. The global Press Freedom Index is published by Reporters Without Borders and the survey notes that journalists in Nigeria are often threatened, subjected to physical violence or denied access to information by government officials and the police. It said that journalists in Nigeria are seeing increased fear and violence in their line of work as media freedom faces further decline. That position is shared by Amnesty International which has published a report that's highly critical of what it says is is the repressive media environment in Nigeria. It says reporters, bloggers and activists face harassment, arrest and detention when they seek to share or express critical views which could drive public opinion, particularly around issues such as national security, elections or high profile corruption. At an amnesty briefing earlier, the organization spoke about what it said was the escalating clampdown on the right to freedom of expression have been wasted by the government over 1.5 trillion naira that the government accrued from fact allocation alone. So I made it a point of duty to ensure that I monitor the government and made them accountable to the society. So when that was ongoing, I was also publishing a book I titled Raped and Enslaved, Abia's Era of Kleptocracy. So Abia State Police Command declared me wanted for cybercrime. They came to my house in Lagos. I was not in Lagos. They came to the island where I stay in Lagos and we laid my 16 years old son. He was arrested and detained for about 48 hours in place of me. Now, finally, when I came back, I heard that I called the Commissioner of Police, Abia State, who asked me to report. So I'm getting to Abia State. I went to the police, Commissioner of Police. Luckily, he has been changed to Mr. Ene Okon. So when I came to him, he said he never declared me wanted. That I should just forget about the story. Then I went to radio station Flow FM. While I was on air discussing political matter and the fact allocation that I agreed to the 17 local governments of other states, the police commissioner and his team came there and picked me, picked me up. While the program was on, they interrupted the program, 
you know, came into the studio, stopped the program abruptly and adopted me to the police station. While I got to the police station, they didn't say anything to me. They just took me to court. The court was arraigned by 5.30, magistrate court, and I was taken to prison for cyber crime law in Nigeria. Scary movie. Well, for reaction from the other side of the political divide to those allegations that press freedom is under threat in Nigeria, I'm joined now in the studio by Barrister Aliyu Abdullahi, a senior member of the Buhari Media Organization, which is a group that supports President Buhari. And of course, the director of Amnesty International in Nigeria, Osai Ajigo, is still with me in the studio. Thank you very much, uh, Aliyu, for joining us. Um, first of all, your reaction to that amnesty report that the government is cracking down on press freedom and free expression in Nigeria. Well, um, <clears throat> I, I read uh, some highlights of the reports. Uh, I don't share the same sentiments with, the, with amnesty. Well, International. clearly not. That's why we've got you. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, and I've listened to some part of your interview before I actually uh, uh, come to the table here. Uh, you see, they, they seem to have gotten a lot of things wrong. And if time permits, I can even mention, I, I, I want to even mention names. Uh, most of the things they were basing their reports on, most of the action, things that happened to the journalists in question, are things that happened under the state governments. Nothing has to do with the administration of President Mohamed Bahari. Last time I checked, we're still operating a federal system of government. Most of those things are things that happen in the respective states. Even Mary Akeri was in our Koyban state because she was filming, I think, the officials of uh, the environmental state uh, 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 board also. And we have the issue of the Jafar Jafar with the governor of Kano state. If, although, yeah, there was intimidation or maybe perceived intimidation. Nothing happened to him. Uh, there were a lot of cases like that. Then there was issue of Samuel Ogundepe. Yes, that happens under the federal government. That's one. They, although they published that he refused, he was detained for refusal to disclose his sources. But you see, this is why there are always two sides to a story. She's a lawyer, I'm a lawyer. How the alternative party and name of Jude in Kasasua? You need to always hear the both sides. Mm. Samuel Ongundipe, in, to my own knowledge, was detained not because he refused to name his sources, but because he leaked state secrets. Yes, highly state secrets. It got he published them. Now we talked about, you know, we want to copy the best of democracies around the world. You know Julian Assange, WikiLeaks. You know how many countries, you know, he has offended with his publications. The United States, they're still actually after him, and a number of other countries. That's, these are the most advanced democracies around the world. So when we talk about freedom of expression, I want, I love freedom of expression for my countrymen, for me, for my children, mm -hmm. for the journalists that are working, you know, so that they can get us informed. But at the same time, I also want a lawful society, a society where law would actually exist. Because the problem is if you commit a violation of a law and then you want to fall on the defense of freedom of expression, no freedom under the chapter four of the constitution that is guaranteed completely absolutely she knows that all the freedoms are not absolute no freedom is absolute. even freedom of life is not absolute it's qualified and is derogatory and he, she knows the conditions where those freedoms can actually be subjected you know that can that the guarantee can be taken away from you for example whenever the matter concerns national security defense public safety order peace and order and health you cannot rely on your guaranteed right of freedom of expression or right. any well, of the other freedoms. Can I just come in there because you've spoken quite a bit? I mean, I, I don't think the issue is so much. I mean, you, you've outlined it, and, and I think most people would, would take on board what you've said. But I don't think the issue is. It's, the issue is the interpretation of the circumstances that warrant the intimidation, the arrest, the attacks on journalists. Because it's a matter of interpretation. You see what I mean? In other words, the law is written, and then somebody takes 
takes that law and applies it to a particular situation and tries to interpret a particular action in light of that law. Can I answer you? That's the issue. Now, <coughs> I agree. Now, in, in carrying out the amended functions, agents of states, they may sometimes, in a vaziliousness, you know, perhaps uh, do things that may sound or look uh, out of place or even contrary to the basic tenets of human rights. Mm. That is very possible. Um, but fundamentally, my own issue here, and this is where I stand, if you do not offend any of our non laws and someone decided to pick you, which is what the report of Amnesty International is trying to portray, right. to pick you just because you have a dissenting voice, opinion, or you're a critic of the government, that this is the kind of perception Amnesty is given for the reasons for the maltreatment, harassment, intimidation, and arrest of some journalists and other people that are speaking out. Now, this is what I have, this is where I disagree with them. Because unless you give me a clear case of someone who did nothing and was actually treated that way or is still arrested by the federal government, I don't want to talk about the state because I'm not here to talk mm. a whole brief on the state governors, this thing, but on the federal government, I'm ready to answer to any of such claim by an association. And I'm happy that the director, she's here. Okay. Well, well, let me put that question to her then. What is your reaction to what he's just been saying, Osai Ojiga, director of Amnesty International Nigeria? Yeah. So you see, um, international law is made by states, and states are considered a unit. So a state cover a specific territorial um, um, area. So when in international law we say we ask Nigeria to investigate to do this, under international law, they see one. It's not federal, it's not state. Mm. Within the internal mechanisms of the state, the federal government can say, okay, because of this issue, this is how we're going to work it out. So I think it's very, we need to make it very clear. International human rights law, the obligation is on the state, and that, that is, is the federal true. government of Nigeria. There might be violations performed by its agents, and we have several cases which have shown that when agents of state perform certain acts, it is deemed to be acts of the state. So some of these cases, like we pointed out, has happened within state governments. But the human rights framework, the protection, the fulfillment, the respect needs lies with the federal government. Mm. And the federal government needs to work out a mechanism through which it would work with the states and the local governments in order to ensure there's full In other words, the federal rights. government can't simply say, oh, well, it's the state government, so, you know, we couldn't exactly. care less, really. I mean, it's got nothing to do with us. We're totally exonerated. Exactly. And then what is interesting, again, is that the states are also using federal laws. So you find some of this um, journalists and bloggers are being charged at the federal high court. So Nigeria as a country has a very complicated, complex, but at the same time interesting legal system because you are being charged at state for a federal crime in a federal high court. Mm. And then it means that those agencies need to apply the principles. And one thing that also baffles me is that all well and good, you could say someone has committed an offense and you arrest and detain the person. Must you manhandle the person? Mm. Must you threaten their family? In the case of the um, journalist in Abia State, they arrested a 60-year-old son, he's a minor. And in any case, we even have laws now which says you cannot replace, you are looking for someone, arrest the person, you cannot arrest this child. That was so wrong. Mm. So we see that there are still mistakes, like you rightly noted too, where they are overzealous, they exceed. And so we're saying, what can we do to in other words, we in. can't dismiss their actions simply by saying that they're overzealous. You see what I mean? Exactly. There, there's got to be a check and balance to stop that sort of overzealousness. We've got 30 seconds before we take a break. Oh, okay. That, that, that's actually true um, on that issue of checks and balance. And that's where uh, human rights organizations and other civil societies come in. And, 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 and it's happy. It's, it's all right. We, we're happy. We like it. It's for the good of the country. As long as it's fair as long as it's balanced, 
And now this is the issue some of us have with Amnesty International, that issue of that perception that Amnesty International, right. Nigeria at least, is not that fair okay. to the administration, it's we'll not come that back. balanced. And we'll I can come give back you, and we'll talk give about some, that. Some no, no, you, you give us that when we come back from a break, but we'll come straight to you when we come back. You're watching the Arise interview, Pentimore still ahead as we continue our chat around that scathing report by Amnesty International about the alleged assault on press freedom in Nigeria. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anyagolo. Now we've been talking about that Amnesty International briefing which has severely criticized the government of President Buhari for allegedly constricting freedom of the press in particular and freedom of expression in general in Nigeria. According to Amnesty, many journalists, bloggers and activists have been harassed, intimidated, attacked and detained for taking contrary positions to the government. The apparent clampdown has raised fears of a further erosion of press freedom in Nigeria under President Buhari, but the administration denies the allegation. Here's Nigeria's Minister of Information, Lai Mohamed, speaking recently about the latest efforts by the government to further regulate the press. Highlights of the recommendations approved by Mr. President are as follows upward review of fines from 500,000 to 5 million naira for, bro for breaches relating to hate speeches, inciting comments, and indecency. Two, willful repeat of infra infractions on three occasions after levying fine on a station to attract suspension of license. Three, upgrade of breach of political comments relating to hate speeches and divisive comments to class A offense in the broadcasting code. Independence of the MBC from political interference in the, in the exercise of its regulatory powers, particularly with respect to the issuance and withdrawal of broadcasting license. Lai Mohamed, Nigeria's information minister, and President Buhari's top supporter, Barrister Aliyu Abdullahi from the Buhari Media Organization, and the director of Amnesty International in Nigeria, Osai Ajigo, are both still with me in the studio. Thank you for staying with us. You were making allegations yes. against Amnesty International before Not we went on a break. Really? Yeah, but uh, this is what I said in Nigeria as citizens, or even let me say, as what do you call me, a supporter of the administration. We would have loved to see a civil society, a human rights organization that will try to hold the government in checks and balances. But in doing that, we want organizations such as AI to have this uh, sense of balance and fairness in whatever they do, especially as AI Nigeria. I will give you an example. In the recent past, when the issue of Omele Shore came in, do you know Moyla Showare yes. is the activist politician exactly. who was detained by the government for yes. allegedly calling yes. for a revolution? Exactly. Do you remember that? Uh, do you recall? Uh, 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 let me tell you, Amnesty, her office actually was in the forefront, that's before even the arrest, of promoting the revolution or the things that Showare stands for. And I felt as an organization like AI, I'm an institutional, they were not supposed to, even if they share the same view, I mean, they shouldn't have gone there. Later when Nigerians, a lot of Nigerians came out to react that why will Amnesty Nigeria, you know, International Nigeria, take that book, promote that revolution now, was from virtually promoting someone who was on the badge of breaking the law of a country you are operating in. Would it have made a difference if the sign had said change they, now? They took rather it. than revolution now and i'm just curious no, not really and i'll tell you why right the reason why it doesn't make a difference because shawari was interviewed by a station by mr rubin abati and he tried as much as possible rubin abati to find out clearly from shawari what he really wants out of that protest or revolution now i don't really care much about the semantics of the name but his intentions were clear he said he wanted a change of government. And even Reverend Avati asked him, so you participated last and actually we are not elected. Can you wait for the next four years? He said, no, they want it now. 
and I like you, Charles, right. without please any sentiments. If you are not waiting for another election cycle, and then there is no evidence of gross misconduct that you can table before your representatives, that you can begin the article of impeachment, then how else do you want to change the government now? Right. Well, I, I so can't now, answer that question because it's not my job to express exactly. my opinion. But, it's but, my but job that to is not, solicit that is not the question to your, make, yeah. your That is not the question. That is not the issue opinion. here. But the issue, Amnesty International, Nigeria, her office was tweeted, promoted what Shawari was doing. Even they ought to know, if they didn't know, that he was on the badge of actually breaking the laws of the country. Later, why did they take out, why did they delete the tweets? Right. Well, if they knew, well, well, if they, if well, they didn't find out that it was really wrong. Fortunately, so she's actually here. Now, so exactly. We'll so when I see a report her. coming right. from Amnesty, Amnesty International, right. with the history I know from then, on the on their perception or the relationship with this administration i would take the airport with a pinch of salt yeah but it's not but they, they, they've never been no you just hold on a second they've never been specific to any administration they have consistently taken a with position the it doesn't matter which government very, it is but but i tell you what let, let me okay. bring osaya she in yeah. she's the director of amnesty international nigeria your considered response Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, I'm glad he said perception because he too knows it's not true. That, we d that, that Amnesty International is biased and is against the government. I want to start by saying that since 1967, Amnesty has been working on Nigeria. And it worked under military rule where there were gross violations of human rights. And President Buhari himself was a beneficiary of advocacy of Amnesty International. Amnesty International does not see any political party or religion or creed. If there's a violation, we'll speak out. It doesn't matter who the person is. I think that sometimes this is where the confusion mm. comes in. It's almost like someone thinks, oh, we're friends, so don't talk about it. You can only, so it's only when you talk about something, that means you're an enemy. And that should not be the stance of um, any government. And in terms of the issues he raised, we should recognize that government is a continuity. So, for example, now we are following up on the case of Kyobel against Shell in the Netherlands. This is something that happened 25 years ago. But when they say the government will have to take responsibility to ensuring Shell fulfills its obligations to the communities, they will not say it's the government Absolutely. of the Abacha regime. It will be the government that is in power at that point in time. So it's unfortunate that... Um, the president is on the hot seat now, but government is a continuity. And you cannot choose at what point mm. the government says, okay, this is mine, this is someone else. Um, regarding um, Shawore's incident, Amnesty stands for the right to protest. The confusion that arose with the tweet he mentioned regarding the revolution now that Shawore had posted was as a result of the fact that people thought Amnesty International was part of that campaign. And that was not the case. And we can't come and start saying, oh, we are not part of this organization, because then people come back and ask, so does that mean that he does not have a right to protest? It was important that that issue was addressed strictly mm. at that point in time. And as an organization, we also pride on ourselves on process. And I can say it now on air that that tweet was preemptive because it had not gone through our own processes. That was why it was taken down. If it was a tweet that was fully approved, it would still be up there. And we'll be able to say this and this is the issue why um, we support this particular position. It was hijacked and the position that was, the perception that was being sent out was that we were working together with the organization and the political party, and that was not the case. And so the risk of being misunderstood in terms of our position on the right to protest and the tweet, it was better for the tweet to go. We stand here to say the right Can to I protest is something yeah, that finish. everybody has a right to do. And we've seen it. We've seen how the labor unions, we've seen how the teachers, we've seen how everyone has been able to express that it's also a form of um, an exercise of freedom mm. of expression and freedom of 
assembly and freedom of association. Right. We understand that, that principle and you, you've articulated it very well. You've got less than a minute to give your you, final word before oh, we I go. I wanted to ask you a question, really. I wanted to ask you a question before I give my finalists. If the situation, for example, if what Shawari was calling for was not a protest, if truly he believed he could affect a regime change, will Amnesty International still support yeah, that but you're position? Saying if. That's yeah, exactly. That, that, that's what I'm saying. Will you still have support as, as an organization? Amnesty International does not take a political stand mm. on okay. any issue. So that that's is why that's our anyone. position. But that is, that, but that's that's the always truth. been the position. It's always there. Mm. We, you that, would that, see in our, we don't take uh, a political right. stand. Okay. That now, is why, have, that is why we work with all governments. Even sure. in mm. China, mm. Amnesty International has reports on China, the same way we have reports on right. the U.S. Okay. So, so let me go about 20, 20 seconds, yeah, give yeah, us exactly. your final word. So, uh, Charles, um, uh, like I said, uh, and I, I believe viewers at home they have been able to decipher this thing uh most of the cases they have here has to deal with the uh, state governors but when i think she opening, answered that but question. in your opening and, and remarks and, right. oh. in your opening remarks you went straight, straight okay. for president uh, Muhammad Bahari. We're, we're, so i'd like to address that there is but any, we're out of time uh, there is no any i want to address one thing no no, no you, you can't to, listen we're literally out of time. i would have just said it <laughs> There is, no Ali, there is no I one I want to thank you very much indeed. And Osai Ojigo, I want to thank you very much indeed for coming on the program. That's it for this edition of The Arise Interview. Join us again for a fresh edition tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.